power, reputation, they fail. They're not just with the people. So Yusuf السلام, said, Pharaoh, make me the treasurer of Egypt because I am knowledgeable and full of wisdom because everyone else that was going to go for it was causing fasad, they were causing corruption. And Yusuf السلام, knew that this became a duty and he did have the God-given skills for it. And truly he led in absolute justice and fairness. Umar radiallahu anhu took this example from the prophets and from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Let us look at how he was so just and so fair. And just to illustrate it, there's one thing I forgot about him. One Byzantine, Byzantine, Roman commander, he went to visit the Khalifa Umar radiallahu anhu for to negotiate something because the Muslims were in constant battle with the Byzantines and the peace treaty was not made. So when they realized their power and how the Byzantines were losing to a lot of the battles of the Muslims, they weren't winning one, not even one. Not one. The commander himself came, I forgot his name now, he went to Medina. And there was Umar radiallahu anhu as the Khalifa. Now he's never seen him before. And you know, if you thought about any country of the world today or any empire in history or any kingdom, always the king or the emperor or the president or the chief, they always dress differently. They dress distinctively. And they have guards, they have security guards, they're in bulletproof cars. All of that, right? Heavy, heavy security. When he went to Medina to see the Amir al-Mu'mineen, he asked for him. And nobody knew where Umar was. <laughs> nobody could say, he says, I don't know, ask so-and-so, maybe you'll find him there or there or there. <laughs> so he was talking about just some, any Joe Blow, whatever. <laughs> and he comes up and you know, Umar al used to be seen in sometimes with his pants, up, his bottom of his pants folded upwards and his legs are in dirt and cement and he's building his own house and making his own cement and putting the bricks together. And he found him sleeping underneath a tree in public, just any tree sleeping, having a nap, a siesta during a day. And he was wearing very normal clothes like anyone else. He did not look like an, a khalifa or a leader. He looked like any common person. In fact, a person who's not even wealthy, just lying there underneath a tree, and everybody's walking past. And so he said, that's your Amir? That's your Khalifa? He said, yes, that's the Khalifa. He said, what the heck is this? This Khalifa, this, this is the, the leader of the army that's been defeating the Romans, the ones that conquered Persia? He said, yeah. Normal. All the Muslims are thinking, normal. You know, what's wrong with that? It's normal. So he goes up to him, and he woke him up, and Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, what, what, what have you come for? What do you want? <laughs> it's normal, like, it's, who cares? You're the commander of Byzantine. What, what do you want? What would you like? I'm busy with the Muslims here. And he said to him, mm, you are Umar Amir al-Mu'mineen. And then he said the famous statement, Adalta fa'aminta fanimt. You established justice. And so you became secure and safe. Nobody wants to attack you. And so you slept in public, not fearing anybody to attack you. The whole purpose, brothers and sisters, of the Sharia ah and Islam and what the, Allah and His Messenger, Allah sent His messengers to, to establish is justice. And worshipping Allah on His terms, but justice. And that's why the great Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah alayhi, if you ever heard of him, great scholar of the 12th century, he said, <clears throat> إن الله لا يقيم الدولة العادلة وإن كانت كافرة ولا يقيم الدولة الظالمة وإن كانت مسلمة. Allah will support and help a government in a country to last if it rules with absolute with justice. Even if it was a disbelieving government. Government doesn't believe in Allah. But he will not 
assist and support a government or a country which rules on injustice to its people, even if it was a Muslim government. That's what Ibn Taymiyyah has quoted in his, he's also said it in his Majmu' uh, um, al-Fatawa. So, brothers and sisters, this is the point. And that's why Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say at the minbar when he gave the khutbah right at the end, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِيْتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى Allah commands, He commands strongly justice. Justice is number one. And you don't have to be a leader to be just. You are a father, you have to be just with your family. You're a mother, be just with your family. You are a brother or a sister, be just. You are at school as a teacher or a principal or you are a student, be just. You sign a contract, be just and fulfill the contract. You make a promise, be just. You hear someone's secret, be fair and just and go and tell people about it. Justice, brothers and sisters, is in everything. And every single one of us here has a responsibility of justice in one, in one form or another. Justice means to place things where they belong, to do the right thing that is fair and just. You borrowed money from someone, give it back as you promised if you can, otherwise seek permission or forgiveness or uh, time to pay. Justice with your wealth, how you earn it, how you spend it, in your business, in your contracts, with your employees, if you're an employer, with your contracts, if you are an employee. Be just. Be just and teach your children, if you have children, justice at home, how to share and how to be fair. Justice. Be just with your sons and daughters. One man entered to the Prophet Sallallahu was a Bedouin. And they were so used to favoring the boys. He, brought, he came inside and he had his son sitting on his lap. His another son came and he put him on his other lap. The daughter came, he sat her on the floor. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stopped and he said, Ma adalt, you are not just. How ya Rasul He said, you, I saw you place your sons on your lap. When your daughter entered, you placed her on the floor. You have to treat her the same as her brothers. Justice, my dear brothers and sisters. So justice is in everything. And we all have responsibility of that. My brothers and sisters, on the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us about our life and how we spent it, our youth and how we spent that, our wealth and where we got it from, and where did we spend it on. And He will ask us about our skills and our knowledge, how did we use it. Did we use it in justice, in, in, in the way of justice, or in oppression and wrong? So my brothers and sisters, this is a very important lesson that we can learn, if anything, from the life of Umar radiallahu anhu, the true Farooq. He was so down the line. We've already Now this is lesson number 10, so we've spoken so much about him. And this was the last point I wanted to say about this great uh, Khalifa, Umar radiallahu anhu, the great companion of the Prophet sallallahu wasallam, whom the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, if there was a Prophet after me, it would have been Umar radiallahu anhu wa arda. Umar radiallahu anhu was, uh, he led a life of, 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 of fairness and he was stern and firm and he was tough on those who were arrogant, soft on those who were weak. Uh, that was Umar. And everybody got used to him being that type of a person. Nobody dared to look him in the eye. He had to, you, you'd have to think a thousand times before you spoke in front of him, radiallahu anhu. However, the fire worshipper, the Magan man, Magan, meaning fire worshipper, that's what they're called, that man, he had an altercation with Umar radiallahu anhu, he was a non-Muslim, a fire worshipper as I said, and he worked for someone, he was a slave of his, and his master used to take, masters had to take taxes from their slaves if they had a business or they worked, and they gave it to the Muslim, to the, to the house of Muslims, to the welfare house of the Muslims. And this Abu Lu'lu'a, his name was, he was angry at Umar radiallahu anhu for telling him that you need to pay the taxes as your master has told you. You know, this is the rule. And he says, he's taking too much. And when he asked him, do you have any skills? He says, yes, I, I work as a builder and as a painter and as this and, and as a that. Maybe not painter, but other skills similar to that. And Umar al said, well, you're fine. You're, you're not really oppressed. And this, the, 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 the tax was about 0.05% of their whole profit anyway. He got angry and he said to Omar, you're going to see, I'm going to get you. And Omar just smiled and laughed and brushed it off. He could have done anything to the guy. He could have said, arrest him, put him in prison, let me see if this guy's serious. But he brushed him off. And Omar had become a little bit more lenient with people when he was the Khalifa. 
Subhanallah, the Abu Lu'lu, uh, he had it, really had it in for him. He got really angry. He's got issues, man. He's got problems. I don't know what it is um, that, that he was so angry about. And he poisoned his dagger, waited for Fajr Salat. And as Umar radiallahu anhu was praying Imam, he was in sujood on the second rak'ah. And he came and stabbed him and ripped his stomach open. And he went unconscious. Then he killed himself. Then Umar radiallahu anhu, the doctors brought him, brought to him, the, his children brought the doctors to him, the doctor to him, and he said, "Farewell, your father. He is going to die. There's no, he's, there's no cure for him. The poison is spread through his blood." And so when he woke up, he said, "Did the people pray?" They said, "Yes, ya Amir Muni. They prayed." And he said, "Alhamdulillah." Then he said about the guy who stabbed him, "Is he Muslim? Not Muslim?" They said, "Is not Muslim, ya Amir al He says, "Alhamdulillah. I'm so glad about that because I don't want to face a Muslim on the day of judgment." to complain to Allah about a Muslim brother or sister of mine. I'd rather a non-Muslim, right, who doesn't believe in God anyway. Brothers and sisters, I, we talked about this last week, and he got buried radiallahu anhu next to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after seeking permission from Aisha radiallahu anha several times. We talked about that. Now I want to talk about how the next Khalifa was elected. So this, is, this involves the time that Umar radiallahu anhu was still alive, for the next three days. After he was stabbed for three days, he drew the line exactly how the Khalifa should be nominated. Now, brothers and sisters, how it should, should be elected. Brothers and sisters, this is what I'm talking about, his justice. He was so down the line. I'm going to explain to you step by step how Umar radiallahu anhu drew the line so perfectly and so beautifully and so clearly so that the next Khalifa can be elected in the most just and fair way, in the best way that would please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing he did was he, he, he sat up and he gathered the people around him, some of the high companions, and he said to them, I have to, we're, we're in danger right now. Just like when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa died and there was no Khalifa, they were in danger of fitna. He says, we are in danger. Nobody knew that he was going to be stabbed. He said, we must draw a line and the rule of how the next Khalifa is going to be elected. There was no single rule that the Prophet ﷺ left them on. It was up to the Khalifa to establish them, to establish what is best. There's no real rule. I, I mentioned it in the first lecture about some of the criteria, some of the requirements, but there's no specific criteria like to the dot. So he said, we need to elect the Khalifa and I will not choose him. That's the first thing Omar Adan said. I will not choose him. Why? They asked him why and he said, I do not want to take the responsibility of the next Khalifa. I have already taken enough responsibility of my own, but I'm not going to take the responsibility even after my death. No, I will not choose him. I leave it to you to elect and vote. But he said, there are two people. If they were living right now, I will not hesitate to choose them. But they died. The first one is Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah, radiallahu anhu, whom the Prophet ﷺ, why he said, because the Prophet ﷺ said, he is aminu hadihi al-ummah. You see, the election was based on what did the Prophet used to say about them and how strongly it was. He said, the Prophet ﷺ said, Abu Ubaidah is the trustworthy man of this entire nation. I would have chosen him, but he has passed away. He died in the ta'un, in the plague. He said, the other man that I would have chosen was an ex-slave. Ex-slave, brothers and sisters. His name was Salim, the slave of Hudayfa, radiallahu anhu. And he said, if he was alive, I would have chosen him because the Prophet ﷺ said he is a passionate beloved of Allah. Sorry, a passionate lover of Allah. And Allah loves him. So since Allah loves him that much, I would have elected him. But he also died in the plague. Brothers and sisters, then Uthman radiallahu anhu was going to be elected, but how? Let's have a look. Umar radiallahu anhu, we said he's a just khalifa. So in those three days that he was stabbed, he said, there are six people still living now 
who were among the ten whom the Prophet وسلم, said they will all go to paradise. A man by the name of Al Mughira, now he was a Muslim, but he was so cunning and sharp. He came to Umar عنه, and said, Oh Amir al Mu'mineen, why don't you choose your own son, Abdullah? Abdullah was a great scholar. The Prophet spoke enormous words about him, beautiful words. And the Prophet died while he was pleased with Abdullah. And Rasul he mentioned people that he was pleased with. عنهم, he was pleased with them. Among them were the ten promised paradise. And among them was Abdullah ibn Umar, he is pleased with him. Now, the ten promised paradise, meaning the Prophet said them in one sentence, one breath, right? One sort of conversation. There are others promised paradise, but not in the same hadith in different separate hadiths. But these were the ten mentioned in one single hadith. Abdullah was mentioned in other hadith, but not among the ten in a row. Doesn't mean that anything. It just means that the Prophet mentioned those ten and they sort of became the highlight. Now, Umar said to this Al-Mughira, he said, you are suggesting Abdullah, my son, he said, yes, the Prophet said great words about him and he is the scholar and he is this and he is that. It's true, Abdullah is like that. But Umar turned to him and he said to him, Allah. May God fight you. Wallahi, you did not say this out of sincerity, wanting to please Allah. <laughs> Which father would say that when somebody comes up and says, choose your son? His own son. And he, 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 was, he was going to bash him. He said to him, God fight you. Wallahi, you did not say my son out of the pleasure of Allah. You, you're trying to say it to please me. You're trying to say it to make me look good or in some way or whatever I will not choose my son it is enough that one member of the Khattab family rules is going to be questioned on a day of judgment than to have two to carry the burden no one who is related to me is allowed to be the Khalifa he ruled that no one of my relatives another man was suggested and he had he was related to Umar from a distance he says no no one from the Khattab will carry this burden anymore for Wallahi, it exhausted me, he said. And it exhausted me, especially after my friend Abu Bakr. I couldn't catch up to him. And my family is exhausted and I denied them many of their rights. I can't do it again. My family is free of it. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, six people from among the ten. And they are, he said, they are Ali radiallahu anhu, Uthman ibn Affan, Talha radiallahu anhu, Az-Zubayr ibn al-Awam radiallahu anhu Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu The cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf These were of the earliest companions of the Prophet peace be upon him And he said among them Six Now there was one more still alive from the ten And his name was Sa'id Radiallahu anhu But Umar radiallahu anhu didn't mention him he only mentioned those six. There could have been seven. Why didn't he mention him? Because Sa'id had two problems. Number one, Umar al knew he's a weak leader. He cannot lead. And secondly, he is related to Umar from his clan. He said no. So choosing a leader was not about who they favored, but who can fulfill it. And then Omar started to think out loud. He's just talking to himself, thinking out loud. He said, my best guess is that most people will only choose among one of these six. I don't think the people are going to choose anyone else. And then he said, they are the six whom the Prophet ﷺ died while absolutely pleased with them. And they wrote the wahi, they wrote the Quran in front of the Prophet peace be upon him from the first letter to the end. And then he says, and if they gave the caliphate to Ali, he would lead them in the right direction. Or, if they don't want him, they can choose Uthman. These are the words of Ali radiallahu anhu, and it's as if he knew exactly what will happen. He knew his people so well, he knew exactly what they're going to choose. And you're going to find that it's exactly how it happened, subhanAllah. Umar, Umar anhu thought of Ali being the, first, the next Khalifa as the best candidate, really, in his opinion. But he, that was only in his opinion. He was not, wasn't saying choose him. He says, I, I think Ali would be the best. If not him, Uthman. But 
He didn't want that responsibility and he wanted the choice to be for the people. Not even his son Abdullah. And Abdullah said to his father, Oh dad, if you like Ali, just choose Ali radiallahu anhu. And Umar said, No, Abdullah, I will not make that choice. I leave that to the people. And that's the way Umar anhu left. Now the way he said it was like this. Umar, he thought it over. And he said to his son Abdullah, you can oversee. He said, my son can oversee the collaboration and the discussion. And Umar said, listen to how intricate. He said, if I die and you haven't chosen the next Khalifa, Suhaib al-Rumi will lead the prayers until you decide. Suhaib al-Rumi is a little bit distant from everyone else. He was a great companion. And he said, he will lead the prayers. He was an ex-slave as well. And he said, you have four days to decide on the Khalifa after my death. So much so, he went to one of the Ansar people and he said, get 40 warriors to make sure that they decide in four days and make sure they prevent any fitna from happening while they are deciding. He's trying to cover all the corners. And then he said, Number one, out of these six, if you are not unanimous upon who shall be the Khalifa, then choose the majority vote. So if four people voted and two of them voted otherwise, choose the four. Choose what the four vote among those six. But if they are equal, like three of you voted one person, another three voted another person, he said, my son Abdullah will judge which of the three, which group can be chosen from. So he might say, this three, everyone choose one of these three. Or this three, everyone choose one of those three. If Abdullah, my son's judgment is not accepted by all of you, choose from the group which you find Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is with. So again, let's say there's people they chose three and another three so they're split he said choose from the three where Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is one of them because Abdul Rahman Auf had a very special place then he said the Rasul Sallallahu said that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is the wise man oh how wise Abdul Rahman is and then he said if you cannot agree Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is the one that will decide how the discussion should go. He will oversee and see our discussion. My son will just come in and make sure that it's still going. So, what happened was that Umar radiallahu anhu passed away and the Khalifa was not elected. Everybody did as he had said. But Umar radiallahu anhu, even before he died, he went to a man named Miqdad ibn al-Aswad. What, why did he go to Miqdad? Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, he said to him, when I am buried, immediately organize a place where they have to meet to decide on the Khalifa. He had to make sure everybody had a role. Just in case they can't decide where to meet, they're going to be delayed, a fitna will happen. Each, he gave each person a role to cover all his corners. I know you're not going to remember all this stuff, but I wanted to highlight, brothers and sisters, how so much detail was put into the election of the next Khalifa because... He is the Khalifa of, 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 of Rasulullah Sallallahu will lead the Muslim world. It's not something simple. And Umar Dawan does not want fitna to show you the justice in the system. So the meeting place was decided where in the room of none other than Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the daughter of the Siddiq Abu Bakr. And Aisha radiallahu anha put a screen, a curtain between the grave of Umar and the grave of her father Abu Bakr and, and the Prophet Sallallahu when she went to visit them. SubhanAllah, even though he's dead, but out of modesty, just out of modesty, just symbolic, she put a screen to say because Umar is not her mahram and to visit Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu in the backyard of her own house. And that screen was extended for the men to meet 
So the Aish Radawan is on one side, because that's her house, and those men, the six who are going to meet, are on the other side, in the house of Aisha. Now, pay attention. It was really the house of Rasulullah, the Prophet, peace be upon him. But the home in Islam is actually named after the woman. And if you're alive, if you're alive, we say the house of you know the man. He is the the leader and the guardian of the house. He is Rabbul Bayt, the Lord of the house. But when it comes to the home, whose home is it? It's the home of the wife. And even after the Prophet's death, they used to call it the home of Aisha, the Hijr of Aisha, or the room of Aisha. Do you understand? So, even when uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even mentions about divorce in the Quran, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions that if men divorce their wife and they still have a idda, a idda is the waiting period before she can, she becomes completely divorced and can remarry someone else, can remarry again or marry someone else. So there's a idda, a waiting period of three menstrual cycles for a woman who still menstruates. And for a woman who has passed menopause, three whole months is her waiting period after divorce. And he, Allah says, in the idda period, Allah says, وَلَا تُخْرِجُوهُنَّ مِن بُيُوتِهِنْ Do not tell them to leave their homes. Look at the intricate detail. Allah did not say, do not tell them to leave your homes. He said, do not tell them to leave their homes. Even if, even if the man, the husband had bought the house and it's his property and she never paid anything, Allah still says, do not take them out of their homes, meaning your wife's home. Even in the idda period, you must leave them in the house. Not allowed to tell her to go to your parents straight away until the idda is over, unless she chooses. You see, brothers and sisters, this is the law of Allah in Islam. There's no favoritism here in it. It's just justice and what's fair and what should be done as according to what Allah knows is right, the way He created us. So anyway, the six men met at the Hijr, the room or the home of Aisha radiallahu anha. And what happened? The first thing Abdurrahman ibn Auf did, he didn't say, okay, let's vote. Subhanallah, he's a very smart and wise man. The, the, he took it the other way. He went backwards. He did, it in, he did it in reverse. The first thing he said is, let's limit the circle. Let's make it easier. He said, I will step down. I won't be a candidate anymore. I will step down. And I offer you, everyone, every one of you, to also choose to step down yourself, don't be a candidate, on a condition that you nominate someone in your place. Doesn't occur to anyone but Abdurrahman. So he steps down and he says to the others, you nominate someone in your place. Abdurrahman nominates someone in his place and now the others each have to nominate. So it ends up being three are out, three are in. But they didn't accept to do that. Instead, each one nominated another person without stepping down yet. Az Zubair nominated Ali, Talha nominated Uthman, and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas nominated Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. So each one's nominating the other person, and the other person can't nominate the person who nominated them. Ali can't nominate Zubair, because Zubair nominated him. Uthman cannot nominate Talha, Talha nominated him, and Abdurrahman could not nominate Sa'ad, Sa'ad nominated him. But Abdurrahman stepped down. He said, I stepped down. Would you all step down? And they were afraid of stepping down. Why? Why? Because if they step down, people may want to elect them as the right Khalifa. At the same time, if they step down, they may elect someone in their place who was not rightful, who wanted to nominate them as well. And if they step down, there could be other problems. None of them, and then Abdurrahman ibn Auf said, I swear by Allah, 
that if one if in either of you offers to step down wallahi by allah i will choose what is most pleasing and just to allah and so all of them stepped down except and nominated the other person ali uthman so there were ali uthman and who and sad Abdurrahman comes up to Ali but before that Abdurrahman says okay no no I'm sorry I'm, I said wrong none of them actually stepped down Abdurrahman said how about if I step down and you allow me to choose myself so they all said okay you choose yourself so I just recall they did not step down in the end it didn't work and he said let me choose but I'll step down myself. So Abdurrahman, Nawaf stepped down and he has to choose from the other five. They said, we all agree. So he went to Ali radiallahu anhu and said, Oh Ali, if I chose you, would you be just and fair to the people? And if I chose Uthman, would you obey and follow him? And Ali radiallahu anhu said yes to both of them. Then he went to Uthman and said, Oh Uthman, if I chose you, will you be just and fair to the people? And if I chose Ali instead, would you follow and obey him without hesitation? He said, yes, either way. So now everybody agreed that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf has chosen from these two, Ali and Uthman. The rest stepped down and were happy. Nobody argued with Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf did something amazing after that. He did not choose Ali or Uthman yet. For the next three days, he did not sleep properly. He did not eat properly. He, did, he didn't even pray the sunnahs of his prayer. Just the farad and he would go. He did not see his family. And he went out to the entire city, inside and even outside as far as he could reach. And what did he do? Not a single person that lived there, or came, or sat, or stood, or went. No caravan that came by. No slave. No, no teacher. No one that he met except that he went there and he asked them individually or as groups one by one he went first of all to the leaders then he went to their people Ibn Kathir Al Ibn Kathir the great Ibn Kathir he says in Bidayah wa Nihaya that he did not leave a single person out that we know he's reported to not leave a single person out so much so that he even asked the most shyest of women. These are the women that hardly ever get out of their house. No one really sees them. And he even reached them and asked them, who do you want? Ali or Uthman? He even went to teachers who were teaching children. You know, circles of children. Teachers teaching Quran to little kids. He went up to those teachers, because people probably think, oh, they're just teaching kids. He went up to them, who should we elect? He even asked the kids, just out of curiosity. He did not leave anyone out until he came to the final result. It was 50-50. 50% exactly. And it was Ali, 50%, Uthman, 50%. The great... Scholars, including Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he says, there has never come a man in history, in history, who got votes 100% in such a fair way, unanimously, like the way Abdul Rahman ibn Auf did it. And Imam Ahmad speaks something else about the Khalifa Uthman as well. On day four, on day four, Abdurrahman ibn Auf goes to Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas and Az Zubayr, the ones that were left out. And he speaks to them from Isha till half the night, discussing Ali Uthman, Ali Uthman, why, why, why? What are they talking about? Five hours, six hours in the night discussing. Then after he finished from them, he goes to, he called Uthman radiallahu anhu himself. He spoke to him from half the night till Fajr. 
Who should I elect you? Why should I elect you? What's, why not Ali? What about Ali? What about, what about, what about? Talking, 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 talking. Then he spoke to Ali. Oh my God. 50, 50 votes. On the fifth day, he went to the masjid. Khalas, they got no more days left. That's what Umar said. He wore the turban that the Prophet Sallallahu gifted him. Rasulullah had gifted Abdurrahman Auf his own turban. And he rose to the mimbar and he called the people. It was such a big gathering that even a bird, they say, could not land. There wasn't a gap for a bird to land. And everybody's right outside, thousands of people. And he spoke. He made a long dua, maybe 20 minutes dua. Then he said, O oh people, I asked all of you, and it is 50-50. So now, I call upon Ali. O oh, Ali, come to me. Ali radiallahu comes. And subhanAllah, by the, I, I forgot to mention, Uthman, who was one of the main candidates, he came late. He came late. And he was sitting in, right at the end. He could barely see him. Unlike today, you know, it's right at the end. It, no one really wants this. They, they know what responsibility means here, what khilafah means. They just want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sincerely. Then he says, oh Ali, come over here. Get up. And he said to Ali, here is my hand. Before you pledge and shake my hand, will you pledge that you will rule by Allah's book, the Quran, and by the sunnah of the messenger of Allah, and exactly by the same judgments and opinions of Abu Bakr and Umar. You have to follow their same rules and their same opinions. And Ali radiallahu anhu refused to shake his hand. Why? He said, I rule by Allah and his messenger. But Abu Bakr and Umar, they are men who make judgments. They could be right or wrong. And I can make a judgment depending on the situation. Why should I rule by the judgments of Abu Bakr and Umar? What if it's the wrong judgment in my time? No, I am a mushtahid myself. And truly he was. Rasulullah called him the greatest judge. He called him the judge of this ummah. He says, no, I have an ishtihad. So he refused to shake hands. Brothers and sisters, do you understand? He could have shook his hand and taken a position, let on do what he wants. But no, he will be questioned. And this is what it means. Oh, Uthman, you come along. He says, will you rule by Allah and his messenger and by the same judgments and opinions of Abu Bakr and Umar? He said, yes, I will. Uthman didn't like to make his own judgments new judgments. He wanted to go by the precedence of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr and Umar. And then Abu, uh, Abdul Rahman lifted up his arms and says, Oh Allah, judge, uh, Oh Allah, bear witness and hear that I have done what pleases you in fairness and absolute justice. And so he shook the hand of Uthman radiallahu anhu and he said, I am the first to pledge allegiance to Amir al-Mu'minin, sorry, to Uthman as Amir al-Mu'minin. Who was the second to Pledge allegiance to him. It was Ali radiallahu anhu. He put his hand out and pledged allegiance immediately to him. Then every single person came one by one pledging allegiance without hesitation. And this is the one where I said, the, the, the scholars including Imam Ahmad, he said, no man in history also, no man in history did all the people, 100%, every single individual in that community or country, no man where every person agreed unanimously to one man to be their leader except for Uthman radiallahu anhu in the history of this world. 100% agreement, unanimous. Every man, every woman, every child, they all agreed to Uthman radiallahu anhu. Subhanallah. And such is the way that Uthman Allah was elected. He had to give his famous speech of being elected like Abu Bakr and Umar, but instead Uthman could not give the first speech. He got up and he said, Oh people, I have been elected the Khalifa and I am not the best among you, but I will give my full speech later. He wasn't a good public speaker, Uthman Allah. He was, he was actually quite shy. And now, I want to talk the first part about his character, 
who he is, Uthman, and how he became a Muslim. And then, insha'Allah, we'll take a rest and continue his story next week, insha'Allah. So he is Uthman ibn Affan, the son of Affan radiallahu anhu. He was born in Quraysh, in Mecca. He was among the, what we call the elites, the really noble clans that go all the way back to uh, the original Arabs of Asma'il alayhi salam. And he was among the most important uh, tribes that everybody respected. He was what we call a nobleman, a great nobleman, a sir, among the most respected in the people of Quraysh, Muslim and non-Muslim. And Uthman radiallahu anhu, he was handsome, very handsome man. He had a, an Arab complexion, but leaning towards the white complexion. And remember we said last time that when Arabs called someone white, it wasn't what we know as white today. White meaning you have a slight tan, but it's a very light tan. They called him white. As for the real white people that we call today, like in those days the Romans, the Byzantines, they called him, they called them the yellow people because of their blonde hair. So this is how they describe him. He was white, very light in color, radiallahu anhu. He was tall. He was well built. He had wide chest and wide shoulders. So he, he was pleasant to look at as, you know, as a feature because he, he, he really filled your eyes when he walked. He had a straight walk, so his legs were quite straight. He was really nice form, Uthman radiallahu anhu. And his most attractive part that really caught your eyes were his eyes. They were desert eyes. They, were, they looked like he had, in our days, mascara on them, but he didn't. They were his natural eyes, long eyelashes. And subhanAllah, when you looked at his eyes, you couldn't help but like him and feel safe around him and just see him as beautiful. He was beautiful. Any person that met him found him beautiful, safe around him, easy to be around him, easy to talk to him. Subhanallah, he gave you that vibe. That was Uthman radiallahu anhu. He had a pleasant voice when he spoke, wasn't too loud or too soft, and he was pleasant to the ear. You can listen to him for hours, radiallahu anhu. And the good thing about him, he was never indecisive. If he knew what decisions to make and he made it once and it was most often the right decision. He was very decisive and precise. And he could tell right from wrong. He wasn't unclear. Very clear man. Anhu. He was a very, very wealthy man. Very wealthy business entrepreneur. And he inherited the business from his father, Affan. He was extremely respected for his amazing businessman abilities and skills. And he was among the most wealthiest where people all came to him. He was so wealthy that in our terms today, you would call him a billionaire. So he was among the billionaires of his people. One thing that was very special about his character and his personality is that he was a very shy man not embarrassed not timid just shy he was modest a very modest man shy he didn't speak much he'll answer your question and he would be precise he wasn't a good public speaker and he was easygoing with the people he covered himself up very well he didn't like showing skin in his body you'd never see him walking around in a singlet for example Probably not even a t-shirt. And he would cover himself all the way as far as he can to his sternum, close to his neck. Anhu. You wouldn't even see him rolling up his pants where you can see his shins. The most you would see is his arms and when he's making wudu, that's about it. So he was a shy man with modesty. There's a difference between people who are shy 
and they're not confident. They've got low self-esteem. So you ask them, what's your name? See, here's, the, here's one thing my teacher once told me back at Lebanon. So there are people, they're shy and modest, and there are people, they are shy because of self -com low self-esteem. The low self-esteem shy person, you say, what's your name? And they'll go, <laughs> what's your name? <laughs> or they'll run away from you. Or they can't put two words together. They'll shiver. A shy, confident person, you'll say, what's your name? My name is Muhammad. But they won't talk too much. Right? But they're just modest and shy. That was how Uthman radiallahu anhu was. Uthman was so shy that even the angels were shy around him. There was one hadith in Sahih Muslim. When the Prophet ﷺ was in his house with his wife Aisha and he was sitting with her in the room covering himself and his wife with a blanket. They were sharing a blanket and they had their legs in. It shows you the romance that Rasul ﷺ had with his wife. Then Abu Bakr approached and knocked. Abu Bakr is the father of Aisha. So Aisha remained where she is with her legs in the blanket, with her husband, normal. Abu Bakr entered, and he wanted something from the Prophet ﷺ. Now I have to mention, because he was covered in the blanket, Rasul ﷺ was relaxed with his wife, and part of his legs were outside of the blanket, his skin was showing, and his pants was rolled up, and you could see his knees, his knee, and you can see a bit of his thigh. Remember what we said about the aura of the man, that it's up to the knee, but technically, technically, but you can have a little bit of the upper, th the, the lower thigh shown, just above the knee. Because Rasulullah was reported to show some of the whiteness of his, of his thighs, they said. So in this instant, again, he was showing a little bit of his thigh and knee. He stayed as he is. Abu Bakr asked him, Ya Rasulullah, whatever he wanted, and he left. Then Umar came. Then Aisha radiallahu left, and her left, Rasul stayed as he is, but she can still see him, the Prophet peace be upon him. When she left, I meant that it's one room, but she just turned around and went a bit to the side. So there was no curtain or anything, just went to the side. And, and Umar radiallahu entered respectfully, asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what he want, whatever he wanted, and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told him. Uh, it goes to show also that uh, in his time, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa wives didn't always hide behind the screen until later on when the ayah came down. But it also shows that if your mahram is with you and uh, your wife or your daughter or whoever it is, your sister is, is, or your mother is well, is veiled very well and the mahrams are there and there's respect between you, it's okay, it's fine. It's not considered free mixing. If, if you want to be with family, for example, and there's respect and hijab is there and the mahrams are there, that's fine. You can be in the same room. But Aisha Dhamma sat aside. After they finished, Uthman radiallahu anhu, came along. He knocked, can I seek permission, Ya Rasulullah? Before he did that, Rasulullah sat straight and covered his leg. He covered it. Then he said, come in. Uthman asked him for what he wanted and he left. Aisha radiallahu anha said, Ya Rasulullah, why didn't you cover with my father Abu Bakr and Umar? But when Uthman came in, you covered up. He said, Ya Aisha, Uthman is a very shy man. He's very modest, very shy. I feared that if he saw me that way, he'll be too shy and he won't ask me for what he came for anymore. Because he saw my leg, he'll probably turn around and walk away. And then he said to her, أَفَلَا أَسْتَحِي مِنْ رَجُلٍ تَسْتَحِي مِنْهُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Why would I not be shy of a man whom the angels themselves are shy of? So this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu was the first ever reported to write the first verses of the Qur'an. So he could read and write. He was an educated man. Not many people could read and write at the time of the Prophet And there were a number of men, sahabas, of the Prophet who wrote the Qur'an in front of the Prophet, peace be upon him, wrote it down on paper and, and whatever. And Uthman was the first to write the first verse ever. I want you to remember this. He wrote it with his right hand. 
the first verse of the Quran to be written. Of course, it was memorized and the Quran was there, but he was the first to actually what? Write it. We're going to come back to that, inshallah, in the next le few lessons to come, when Uthman radiallahu anhu is killed. And I'm going to come back to this story about his hand writing the first verse of the Quran. Remember this, inshallah, when the time comes. So Uthman radiallahu anhu was that. One time, Ibn Umar, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, another companion of the Prophet وسلم, he was with the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, there comes a man. A man came past wearing a turban and things. And he said, there comes a man, he said, this man wearing the headgear will be killed wrongly and oppressively. Ibn Umar looks, he says, and I saw Uthman. Rasul had already told us, prophesied by Allah subhanahu wa had told him, this man, Uthman, will be, will be killed wrongly and oppressively. In the hadith which is in Sahih Bukhari, we mentioned that last time, Rasul sallallahu was climbing up the mountain Uhud, and Uhud shook, and with him was Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, radiallahu anhu. Rasul sallallahu said to Uhud, Uthbut Uhud, Calm down. فَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ نَبِيٌ Walking on top of you is a prophet. وَصِدِّيقٌ A man who believes the prophet before anyone else. Or Abu Bakr. وَشَاهِدَيْن And uh, Sorry, not shahidain. That's the wrong grammar. Shahidain means two witnesses. وَشَاهِدَيْن Shahidain means two martyrs. Who were the two martyrs? Umar and Uthman. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he first met Uthman, radiallahu anhu, he actually met him, but when, when Uthman Adana first became a Muslim, there's a little story to that. He was the fourth man, or the fourth person, to become a Muslim. The third man, the fourth person. The first man to enter Islam was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Okay, let's say without the gender. The first person to embrace Islam was Khadija radiallahu anhu, his wife. Followed by Abu Bakr, followed by Ali radiallahu anhu, followed by Uthman, and then Fatima later on. But Fatima was still small at that time. So Uthman is the fourth person to embrace Islam. How did he embrace Islam radiallahu anhu? By the way, he never drank alcohol and he never ate pork. But he worshipped idols. Abu Bakr was one of his close friends. And Abu Bakr was also an entrepreneur, a great businessman himself. So they knew each other from their trips to Syria and Sham and their trades. So Abu Bakr sees Uthman and he comes up to him and he starts talking to him about this deen, Islam, in secret. He said, this is the messenger of God and you know who Abu Bakr, who know who the Prophet is and you know and you know and you know. And Uthman would nod his head and says, yes, you are truthful, you are truthful, you are truthful. Then Abu Bakr Dawna said to Uthman, Ya Uthman, these idols that you worship, isn't it true that they cannot feed you or even feed themselves? He said, yes, that's true. He says, isn't it true that they cannot benefit themselves and benefit you, protect themselves or protect you? He said, that is true. We're only worshipping them to bring us closer to God, the real God. He goes, then why don't you just worship the real God and he's the messenger of God telling you this? You know him. So he gave him big da'wah. And Uthman radiallahu said, you are truthful in everything you are saying, ya Abu Bakr. Because then why don't you embrace Islam? And he just stayed quiet. He wasn't ready. You know, hidayah comes to you, but you've got to make that step. Once you make the step, Allah gives you the hidayah. Then as he's talking, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa comes past. As he's talking, he says, subhanAllah, I saw the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa come past and with him was Ali radiallahu anhu. So I saw Abu Bakr go up to the Prophet ﷺ and whisper something to him. Maybe he was saying something like, this is your chance, give Uthman a talk, he just needs a little bit more. So Rasul ﷺ comes up to Uthman, Uthman says he sat in front of me and there was something about Rasul ﷺ's face, just the way he talked to you, the way his presence was. And he said to me only one simple sentence, Ya Uthman, Ajib, Ajibillaha ilal jannah. Or he said, Ya Uthman, 
أجب الله إلى جنته فإني رسول الله إليك وإلى جميع خلقه أو عثمان respond to the call of your Lord to his Jannah to his paradise for I am certainly the messenger of Allah to you and to all of his creation that's it Uthman radiallahu says Wallahi I don't know what happened to me those words from the messenger of Allah entered my heart so strongly by God even my mother and father I would sacrifice and ransom if he was a hostage I would ransom my own parents to save him I don't know what happened to me such beauty that he said to me such eloquence and the way he said it to me it entered my heart immediately I said Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka rasulullah I bear witness there's only one God and you are his messenger and so Uthman radiallahu anhu embraced Islam again without hesitation to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but he had a bit of hesitation while Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was talking to him however it opened his heart and he embraced radiallahu anhu wa ardahu so my dear brothers and sisters, Uthman radiallahu anhu is that type. You can tell. Now he's going to become the Khalifa after a very strong, firm, tough man like Umar. And now they're going to choose a Khalifa who is total opposite of Umar radiallahu anhu. The other way. Why? The scholars spoke about it and they said it, it perhaps it is Allah's choice because of the way, the type of people he was about to lead. Now the people were ready to have a different type of personality that would suit them. The people were ready, they were established, they had glorification, they had, and some of them had a lot of pride and they were very happy about themselves. Now they needed leniency. They needed somebody who lets them do their thing now. Doesn't judge them for everything, doesn't tell them off about everything. People were ready now. Umar had laid the foundation and now you've got to let them go. It's like when your children, you have control over them when they were little children and they won't listen to you a lot sometimes but you have some control, you can make some rules and then they become teenagers. And, all, and then after that they become adults. After you've raised them, now they're adults, they know the rules, they know you've raised them, you've done your duty, now you can let them go, make their decisions now, they know what to do, you've taught them the morals. And so was Uthman. He was now leading people like having children who became teenagers at the time of Umar. He set them straight and now they're adults, let them do their thing. And so Uthman radiallahu anhu led the people in that way. One very important thing to say about Uthman before Aisha. One of the amazing characteristics of Uthman radiallahu anhu was that he was not only wealthy, but he was extremely generous. He donated and donated before Islam and after Islam. Anybody who came to him with help, he would help them. He was always the first. And truly, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa told us when he was asked, who are the best of Muslims? Now, he said, they are the ones who were the best in character before Islam, before they were Muslim. When they were non-Muslim, they were known to have the best of characters. They end up being the best of characters after Islam, when they become a Muslim. Uthman was one of those. He was among the best in character before embracing Islam. And so he became among the best in character when he embraced Islam. And he is the one of the ten promised paradise mentioned in the hadith. Uthman radiallahu anhu was so generous that there was once a well owned by a Jewish man who lived from among the Bani Quraidha, I think. Bani Quraidha or Bani Nadir, one of the neighbors of the Muslims who were, had a peace treaty with the Muslims. And uh, the Muslims were suffering. There were poor people. There were migrants or refugees going from Mecca to Medina. And they were very poor. They needed, they needed wealth. They needed help. And this well, the people needed it because they used to, they were farmers. And they needed to graze their lands and needed to help these refugees. So they went, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went up to this Jewish man and asked him to sell them the well. Because he was charging people quadruple to hire it and to give them water to, 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 to grow their crops. The Jewish man refused to sell it for the price that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam offered him. And he gave them a hefty, hefty price. 
so much that nobody could afford it because the Jewish man didn't really want to sell it. So he put a hefty price and no one could afford it in Medina. The only one who could afford it was who? Was Uthman radiallahu anhu. The man asked for what is equivalent today to 40,000 US dollars. I already calculated it. It's 20,000 dirhams, which is equivalent today to about 40,000 US dollars. In those days, 40,000 US dollars is, is huge. It's like asking for 40 million today, according to their livelihood and their, you know, if you take away inflation and all that, 40,000 those days was huge. Remember the days when you can buy a house here? Oh, you don't remember, maybe your parents. You could buy a house here in Australia for six thousand dollars, six grand. I know a friend of mine has got a house bought for six grand back in the seventies, and now you can't buy it for less than one and a half million, right? So inflation and all that. So when you say forty thousand US dollars, like forty million dollars in his time, he literally went and bought the well for forty thousand US dollars, twenty thousand dirhams in the millions. And the Jewish man couldn't resist. He said, take it. It's all yours. And then Uthman radiallahu anhu donated it to who? To the Muslims. He said, it's all yours. He said, it is for Allah forever. I donate it for the sake of Allah, for the Muslims forever. Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. This well is still giving water till today. And it is in Saudi Arabia, in Medina, a few, just a few um, meters away from the Prophet Sallallahu mosque. Until today, it is still for free to graze the lands of people who need it. <coughs> and it gives to the poor and the orphans and the needy. Still flowing till today. The sadaqa that is ongoing of Uthman al Until today, the Ministry of Agriculture and and, and I don't know what they have this is legally named the waqf the uh, uh, the what's a waqf the um, the what endowment yeah sorry guys I'm really tired today endowment of Uthman for the Muslims no, no they don't charge anyone for it subhanallah and no one's allowed to buy it or own it 1,400 years, brothers and sisters. It is a sadaqah jariyah from Uthman. And this is what I advise you, brothers and sisters. In your life, put some money aside. And if you don't have money, put some skill aside or something that you can invest in or leave. Even if it's something as small as leaving a... We have a lot of mushafs at the masjid, alhamdulillah. But maybe any masjid needs something or an organization needs something or anywhere else, a hospital, a, a, an organization, anything at all. It doesn't have to be a masjid. Anything that you can invest and put that is ongoing for the Muslims or you make something online, I don't know what it is. Everybody has some skill. You can write a book, you can invent an app, anything. That can be an ongoing charity after you die. There are three things that count for you when you die. Number one, a righteous child that makes dua for you. Because the child is your work. Number two, an ongoing charity that you left behind. You might send uh, some money to some country in the world through one of the trusted Islamic organizations, charity organizations, to build a well. Water is the best thing. Or an ongoing knowledge that you left behind, that people can learn from in one of the resources anyway, that people can still learn from. You will continue to receive the benefit and the rewards of it even after you die. As long as people are using it and learning from it, subhanAllah. And that's the example of Uthman radiallahu anhu till today. So brothers and sisters, I'll stop here now inshaAllah. We'll continue next week, the long story. It's a long story. Uthman radiallahu anhu is uh, quite a long one. It'll probably be about another three lessons. And inshaAllah, we will learn so much, especially the most challenging part for me, I'm going to try my best to articulate and to be as clear as possible to you the end of his life when the fitna between the Muslims started to erupt. And the hardest one for me will probably be when we get to Ali radiallahu anhu. But I will try my best by the will of Allah and ask Allah to assist me in bringing the story to you as fairly and just as I can and as balanced. 
Thank you for listening. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Three minutes. So inshallah we're praying Aisha at 10 p.m.